Now let's sit nice and tall. And sit tall and close the eyes. And just take these few moments to breathe mindfully. Allow yourself to arrive in this moment. Place your right hand on your heart and left hand on your belly. And just feel yourself breathing. And also feel yourself being breathed. The flow of the breath in and out is the dance that you engage with. is the beautiful partnership that you have with the divinity of the universe. Nourishing you with each inhale and inspiring you to peace with each exhale. Drawing the hands together in front of the heart. We'll lift our voices in one om, followed by the invocation mantras. If you know them, please join. Breathing in. Om. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Ganana antwa ganapati gum hava mahi kavin kavinam upamashravastamam jesta rajam brahmanan brahmanas pata anashrin vanu ti pisita sadhanam maha ganapata ye namaha Prano Devi Saraswati Vaje Bhir Vajini Vati Dhina Mavitriya Vatu Ano Divo Brahatav Parvata Da Saraswati Ajata Gantu Yagnyam Havan Devi Jujushana Krita Chi Shadman No Vacha Mushati Shrinotu Vag Deviai Namaha. And gently releasing the hands down, fluttering the eyes open. Hello and welcome to everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, so today's conversation will be about trauma. Mm and a spiritual perspective on trauma, how we can view trauma in our life in a way um, that can empower us to do the work that needs to be done, can empower us to, to build ourselves up beyond the trauma, to transform ourselves so that the trauma is not the defining force in our life. So some of you might be thinking right now, I don't have any major trauma. Um, most people misunderstand trauma. They don't realize that it, it doesn't have to be a huge explosion. It doesn't have to be something larger than life. Each and every one of us experience traumas every single day. And as the world moves forward in these times, it seems due to overwhelmedness, long work weeks, lack of sleep, general increase in violence within society, that these day-to-day typical uh, traumas that we experience, we are less and less capable of dealing with. That it doesn't take very much for us to reach the end of our rope. It doesn't take very much for us to, to lose our patience. It doesn't take very much for us to feel as if we're being bombarded by day-to-day living. And so... Many researchers today, many anthropologists, many doctors, they they say that our society is existing in a state of chronic fight or flight. 
chronic fight or flight, it is such an unfortunate way to live. So what is fight or flight syndrome? Fight or flight syndrome is when the nervous system is in what's called the sympathetic state, meaning that it is in high alert. It is paying attention to everything that can go wrong. It's getting ready to either duke it out or to run away. It's waiting for the next bomb to drop. And when we are existing in that state most of the time, it's very hard to smell the flowers, to appreciate the beauty of nature, to have trust in other people or in life itself. When we're existing in a state of chronic fight or flight, our sleep patterns are disrupted. Our eating patterns are disrupted. All the patterns that we rely upon for a general sense of health and wellness become disturbed and disrupted. People report having increased nightmares, having shorter tempers, feeling more anxiety. And when that happens, what else happens physiologically is that the heart races. And that has the potential to lead to issues like high blood pressure. We become so hyper aware because we're waiting for the next bomb to drop that we become actually unaware of the inspirational things in life. And we become so tired that when something significant does happen, we're, we're just simply at our wit's end. It's enough to, to leave us feeling broken. So, so trauma is really important because if we don't make some kind of an adjustment in, in our lives to the way that we're living our life, then we will fall prey to the impact of the stress of day-to-day dramas. Traumas. <laughs> I keep saying dramas. Uh, but it is drama too, you know what I'm saying? It is, absolutely. <clears throat> and I don't mean that in a, in a belittling way. I just mean that everything we do as human beings is drama. You know, when we talk, it's drama. When we eat, it's drama. Did any of you have lunch yet? No? Well, when you do, it's going to be a drama. <laughs> because it's apparently very good. Yeah. So, so we, we engage in these day-to-day tra- traumas, and, and we do our very best in order to navigate them. But the reality is they just keep surmounting as long as we don't make lifestyle modifications to bring ourselves to a place where our nervous system is empowered to switch appropriately between the sympathetic fight or flight and the parasympathetic, that sense of I'm calm, I'm content, I'm okay, I'm even happy. If we're able to flip back and forth appropriately, then what we find is that we, we have more energy. We have a greater capacity to trust others and to trust life. We sleep better. We eat better. We look for the positivity in life. Our body functions more appropriately, generally speaking, absent any medical issues. We support ourselves and each other. We're not afraid of unity. When we're in fight or flight, we're afraid of unity. We're like, I've had enough and I don't have room for whatever it is that you're going to bring into my, my environment, so I'm going to keep you at arm's length. And we can't experience unity if that's the mindset that we have. So we have to be really mindful about how we are investing our energy into this epidemic of chronic fight or flight syndrome in our society, this chronic re-traumatization. Now, some of you might also think, well, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty well off. I, I have kind of a you know, middle-class lifestyle. I'm, I'm not suffering financially. I've got an education. I've got this, I've got that. I don't really have a right to complain. Those other things don't have much whatsoever to do with the rest of what I'm talking about. Hopefully they would have something to do with your ability to alleviate the traumas through access to therapy and access to mindfulness practices and all these types of things. But when it comes to the experience of trauma, 
a lot of that experience is actually out of all of our control. Those day-to-day stressors, the, the, the way that the world functions, if that makes sense, is really not our decision. What is our decision is the way that we function within that realm and the way that we function together as a smaller community within that realm. That is within our control. But what the powers that be decide to do is not up to us. Right? Not really. And then there's also the other aspect of, of, of trauma, which is that which is unexpected. So, you know, like accidents and disasters and things like that, those are way out of our control. I mean, look at, the, look at all the people in Hawaii right now who are suffering so much from an unexpected trauma, you know. So, so those things we can't do much about either. So we can't do much about natural disasters and unexpected traumas. We can't do very much about the trauma that comes to us as a result of, of the world outside of us. But we can do something about the traumas that we ourselves invest in day to day, starting with the little things, like how we sleep, how we eat, how we relate to one another. So there is a quote, and I'm not sure who said it, but it's the paradox of trauma is that it has both the power to destroy and the power to transform and resurrect. Do you know who said that? Yeah. It's a great quote, though. It's truly a great quote. Yeah. And so so when we look at that, we say the, the uncontrollable, I can't control. But the controllable, I'm either going to ignore and allow myself, my happiness, my dreams in this life to be destroyed. Or I'm going to invest in my life in a particular way that transforms, that lifts up, that inspires. If you had to make one change in your life right now to make it slightly less recurring trauma, just a small change, not the big ones, what would it be, Karen, Dira? What would you make different? I know because you're looking at me and you know what that means. What's one small change you would make in your life right now to make it a, a, just less, less fight or flight? Um, just more breathing exercises every day. Um, mm-hmm. Taking my practice more seriously and mm-hmm. yeah. myself to that. And that, that has helped me like, tremendously, but I know I could do a lot more. We can always do more, right? But yes, exactly. So breathing exercises. And why are the breathing exercises so important? Well, because the way that you breathe is directly connected to the condition of your nervous system. So there's a couple of different types of breathers, those who breathe. And I'm going to focus on two. So the first one is the shallow breather. So for those of you who don't know what the lungs are like, or aren't, aren't overly familiar with it, your lungs are, um, the, the right lung has three compartments, the left lung has two. There's these little, uh, these little, I just lost the word, uh, alveoli, these, these little mechanical things in your lungs called alveoli, and they're blood exchange, uh, gas exchange mechanisms. Boy, my words are not with me today gas exchange mechanisms that are situated within the lungs that take in oxygen and nutrients from the inhale and release toxins that they have collected through the bloodstream for the exhalation. So so number one, your breath is the major detoxifier for your body. Most people think that it is the bowel or the urine or the sweat that gets rid of the toxins in the body mostly, but it's not. It's your breath. Your breath is responsible for between 75 and 80% of toxics, toxic release in your body. So, so if you are a shallow breather, you're facing a major issue about that detoxification. Because most of those little alveoli, most of those little mechanisms that are responsible for the gas exchange, the oxygenation of the blood and the detoxification of the body are in the lower part of the lung. There's some in the upper part, but nowhere near as many. So if you're only always breathing up here, you're not getting adequate oxygenation of the blood, which is going to make you tired and lethargic and feeling weak. 
you're not getting adequate detoxification of the blood, which is going to make you feel fatigued and tired and weak. And that in and of itself is going to put you into a state of fight or flight because you're going to be constantly feeling vulnerable. Now, additionally, that, that shallow breathing has other implications also. It can affect your blood pressure. It can affect so many of the different functionalities of the body. It can affect your ability to think clearly. So, and, and I don't know about you, but I know that like when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling tired, when I'm feeling not well, I, I'm not likely to take as good care of myself, right? Now, your diaphragmatic breather, on the other hand, so you've got two lungs and then you've got, the, they're within the rib cage and the heart is, is just, you know, just slightly left of center. And then you have this diaphragm. And the diaphragm is a bit of a flat muscle that separates what's inside of the rib cage from what's inside of the abdomen. And when you breathe in, your lungs expand and the diaphragm presses down into the abdomen and that causes your belly to bloat. And when you breathe out, the lungs release some amount of air, the diaphragm moves back up toward and into the rib cage and the belly contracts. That's diaphragmatic breathing. It is the most beautiful mechanism that nature has ever created because that type of breathing is responsible primarily for peristaltic activity of your digestive system. It's why you poop, right? I know it's okay. We can talk about poop. It's good. So it's why you poop. So if you're a shallow breather, you're probably also constipated. And have you ever seen a happy constipated person? No, right? They seem more like they're worried about when the heck they're going to poop next. It's all about poop. <laughs> totally. So, so when you're a diaphragmatic breather, not only are you oxygenating, oxygenating the blood more effectively, detoxifying the body more effectively, you're also engaging the digestive process, the peristaltic activity more effectively, all of these things are happening more effectively. That deep breathing. Additionally, they say that because of that diaphragmatic action, you are initiating messaging through particular nerves located in your spine because of the, the, the bloating and the releasing of the abdomen, that you're initiating certain functions of nerves in the spine that are responsible for initiating parasympathetic activity, the I'm okay feeling the contentment feeling. So breathing, absolutely important. Make your exhale longer than your inhale. That will automatically start to lower down a little bit of that fight or flight toward a greater sense of, of contentment and okayness. What would you do, Kathy? What's one, one small thing that you would change in your day-to-day -day living that would move you away from the stress that brings about fight or flight? Uh, probably do more stretches, more um, yoga practice at home. Absolutely. And, and why is that important? I'm loving these answers, <laughs> by the way. That's absolutely important. And it's important because when we walk around in a chronic state of fight or flight, we're contracted. We're constricted. Our muscles constrict. We have a sour face, you know, we hunch our shoulders, we round them forward, we compress our heart, we hold in because, you know, we're in protection mode. And as a result of that, so many things suffer. First of all, you can't breathe fully that way. You're not going to digest fully that way. Your heart symbolically is closed <clears throat> off, shut off. And so your emotions are going to reflect that. So many different things. So when you practice the asana, the yoga asana, you're elongating the muscles. You're alleviating at least some of that tension. And it's giving you greater overall circulation in your body. Yoga is so beautiful. It is just so intelligent. Just a downward dog or lying on your back with your arms behind you and you're pointing your toes and lengthening the whole body 
has the potential to improve overall circulation in the body. Just a little tiny smidge of a bit. It's not a miracle worker, but it almost is. <laughs> and, and that greater overall circulation is going to start clearing you out. As Rumi said in my favorite quote by him, for some greater delight. And what is the greater delight? A greater sense of peace. A greater sense of peace. Does anybody else have something that they would do? One small little change in their day-to-day life. Michelle? I would journal more. Oh! I don't get it out on paper enough. I just hold it in and walk around and it's better. Funny you say that because our retreat attendees have been journaling or at least a little bit over the weekend and they're going to have one more exercise at the end of the class today. So, So yes, journaling. And now why journaling? Because as Michelle said, otherwise, whatever we're thinking, we carry inside of ourselves. And if we're thinking a lot of heavy thoughts, if we're having a lot of heavy fears that are becoming statements in our mind, then our mind becomes held hostage by those thoughts, by those statements. And that has an impact on our overall system. It impacts the way we walk, the way we sit, the way we talk, our worldview, our perception of ourself. And it doesn't leave in that. So everybody put one finger out like this. And now these five fingers up. These five fingers are the five worst thoughts that you typically have about yourself or the world. Wrap them around that finger and squeeze as hard as you can. Is there any room there for a positive thought to fit in? (laughs) I take it that's a no? (sighs) Let go. That's what you got to do, right? That's that's what we mean by let go. It means stop, stop suffocating yourself with these thoughts. Free them just even a little, little tiny bit by writing it down in a journal. Then it doesn't have to take up space in your mind. And there'll be more space there for you to choose a different thought. A thought that is more conducive to contentment and peace. So just a couple of really great examples. Thank you for those of you who shared that. Really wonderful examples. Now, this all sounds really great. We can sit down, we can breathe more, we can practice more postures, we can start to journal. But these three things alone are not enough to to directly address the impact of small and large trauma, of day-to-day typical trauma and of those other unexpected traumas. Generational trauma, cultural trauma, all of these different types of trauma, much of which we will not be able to change the condition of outside of our self. It's within the self that the change has to happen, right? In order for us to have a healthier life, a happier life, to be able to feel more inspired. So there's five basic guiding principles that we each need to put into place in order to work effectively with our trauma. The first one is creating safety. And I think that of, of, of all the questions I've ever been asked about trauma, this is, this is a big one. How do I create safe boundaries? What are safe boundaries? And what about if people don't want to honor my boundaries? Well, first of all, you don't make boundaries because you're worried about what other people are or are not going to honor. You make boundaries for yourself. Now, that, Talking about this earlier this weekend, a couple of years ago, I was speaking on a panel about safe boundaries. It was during the the Me Too movement, and I was asked to come in and, and, and contribute some thoughts on the idea of boundaries. And there were several other very wonderful, very intelligent, wise women on that panel with me. And their messaging was not all the same, but in the same vein of... We need to make these boundaries so that they don't bother us. We need to make these boundaries so that they don't hurt us. We need to make these boundaries to keep them away. And I'm paraphrasing greatly, but I think that you get the idea. This is the general understanding of what a boundary is for. A boundary is to keep the thing out. And my suggestion was, you know, when I started talking was I said, I'm going to take this in a little bit of a different twist and say the healthy boundaries that we create are not about keeping other people out necessarily. 
It's about maintaining a space where we can work on ourself so that my own weakness, and I don't mean that in a negative way, I just mean the skill that I have not yet created within myself can be manifested so that I don't give in to my own weakness, so that I don't give in to to my tendencies to allow you on any level whatsoever to behave in a way that demeans me. Because if you, you know, we oftentimes say, well, a good healthy boundary is telling people where to put it. That's not a healthy boundary. A healthy boundary is knowing when to walk away, knowing when to fight, and, and knowing when to accept. That's a healthy boundary. So, so this idea that a boundary is actually more about me than it is about anybody outside of me. It's about me having a space, a safe space in which to do the work. So that's the first place. That's the first way to take a look at boundary or, or at this idea of creating safety. And the second is within that healthy boundary, cultivating the strength within oneself to know the difference between a healthy relationship and an unhealthy relationship, and then to make appropriate changes in your life so that those individuals who are not healthy toward you have less access to you. You can't just put the fence up and say, you're not allowed here anymore, because that's not going to work. You need to take a look at the relationship and understand why it's not healthy. What is it that you're allowing? What is it that they're imposing? And, and where is your strength in this? Where is your resiliency in this? Where is your capability in this? To say, I do not accept this behavior toward myself because it's harmful, not only to me, but also to you. Because anybody who comes to you in a harmful way is not only harming you, they're also harming themselves. And we don't often think about that, right? We're like, well, the heck with them. They're the ones that are being a jerk. (laughs) And it's like, well, they're being a jerk because they're already in a state of harmfulness. They're already harmed. They're already traumatized. So they're only playing out their trauma. And that's not an excuse for them. There's no excuse for poor behavior. There's only correction. Correction for poor behavior. But there can also be understanding that an individual who is violent, an individual who is, who is vocally harmful, an individual who is insulting or demeaning, that they're not speaking from a rational place. A rational person is not going to hurt another person. They're speaking from a place of their own belief in brokenness and their own search, their own dramatic, deep search for meaning in their own life because they have no idea about their own self-worth, about who they truly are, what they could truly bring to the world. They have no self-value. So again, not an excuse for poor behavior, but an understanding and an understanding that allows us to deal with those types of people differently. We don't have to say, you know, I'm shutting you off. That's it. You're done. I'm deleting you off of my Facebook account. It's over. I will never speak with you again. Because unless you've cultivated awareness, that's not going to happen anyway. You know, 72 hours from now, when you cool off, you know, you're going to add them back onto your friend list. And is anything going to change in that relationship? No, because you haven't set terms. You haven't negotiated the relationship. You haven't looked at it and said, this is what I'm willing to tolerate and this is what I am not willing to tolerate. And now the ball is in your court. Are you willing to respect my wishes or are you not? Are you willing to at least look at it, work at it, This is for friends, this is for parents, this is for lovers, this is for partners, this is for children, this is for everybody. We have the right to negotiate our relationships into a place of greater safety. If we don't, 
then we can't expect very much in that relationship because we haven't set the terms and we haven't set the consequences of breaking those terms because no boundary is worth anything if there is not a consequence associated with breaking the terms of the boundary. Oftentimes people will ask, they'll say, well, how do I make a healthy boundary? Just as an example, you know, if somebody is constantly calling you names, a partner or a child or a parent, then the, the statement to them is, you have a right to say whatever it is that you wish to say. And I have a right to not listen to it, to not make myself accessible to it. If you continue to say those cruel, harmful things to me, after I've explained to you what those words bring to me, how, how I feel when I hear them, then I will have no choice but to minimize my contact with you. And then you have to cultivate the courage within yourself to do it. Because a boundary with no held consequence is not a boundary, it's a broken fence. And you know, you can have horses in a corral, it's a good thing. But if the fence is broken, (laughs) bye. (laughs) You know, so same thing. So we have to be really clear that as we are you know, addressing our traumas, whether they're the, the daily traumas that we deal with and that are escalating for, for all of us, or deeper held traumas. Number one, cultivating safety, safety in our relationships, safety in our environment as best we can, safety in our own thoughts. So don't let your own thoughts be the trap of violence for you. If you know that your tendency is to walk through your day demeaning yourself, minimizing yourself, saying things that cause you to have a lack of trust or faith in in the potential of your own life, you have to change that and make your mind a safer place for you. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. So the second is making meaningful choices. And this falls right in line with, with the creation of safety. Meaningful choices. Stop with the excuses. No excuses, or fewer at least. We don't say no excuses because you can't go cold turkey. You know, we can't go from being generally flawed individuals, which is a beautiful thing to be in some regards, to being absolutely perfect human beings who make no mistakes whatsoever. That's not going to work. You should drive yourself mad. And then you'll feel like you failed. And so don't do that. But do pick one excuse. What's one excuse that you, that's your go-to? Because of an upbringing. Like parents are not modeling. Okay. That's, a, that's actually such a great example. Thank you. So it's my parents. It's because of them. Don't say that to yourself anymore. Because you're now, what, 36 or something, 32 Oh, you're welcome. (laughs) I really felt like 36 or something. Um, So you're 52. It's no longer your parents' fault. You've had enough time to educate yourself. You've had enough time to to recognize where where the holes were in their parenting. and, And you have the capacity as an intelligent woman or as an intelligent man to go out and to fill those gaps yourself. So stop blaming them. No more blaming them. Now, change that blame to gratitude for the understanding that they did what they could do and that they're just as flawed as everybody else. And if we look at our own parenting or our own friendship techniques, our own relational techniques, we're full of holes too. So they're no different than we are. We have less faith in ourselves. We have less faith in other people. We... We doubt ourselves, just like they do. So, so have compassion for the struggle that the parent went through. And just understand that in a given moment, they did the best they could. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about deeper traumatic relationships. I'm talking in general here. 
right, in general, there's always a necessity and something that I strongly suggest to people for, for some additional support when we're talking about the deeper traumas, abuse and whatnot. Counseling, for example, you know, something very profound to help work through those issues. But when we're talking about, you know, the, 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 the little things that were left out, we can let go of those now. We can let go of those. Somebody a volunteer, what's your go-to excuse in life? Why, Anne-Marie? I'll never change. I'll never change. <laughs> there you go. Make a better choice with that thought, please, right? I'll never change. Why will you not change? What was that? Every, every moment. You're changing. Nothing really stays the same. Absolutely. Every moment you are already changing. It's just that you're saying, I'm not going to change in that way. It's not that you won't. It's not that you can't. It's that you won't. You're choosing to say no. So change your answer to yes. I'm going to change because I understand that if I continue on this path in this direction, I'm saying no to everything else. And there could be some pretty freaking wonderful things out there I'm saying no to. I won't know who I am until I start living outside of my very small identification box. So start saying yes and start taking a chance. How many of you like to see yourself in, in your mental vision as a brave person? Raise of hands. As an adventurous person? As a memorable person? As a happy person? I mean, we could go on, right? So you all see yourself that way, like in, in, in your mind. If only I could have this, I would be this, I would be this, I would be this, I would be this. Well, start saying yes so that you can know those people. Because if you continue saying no, and it hasn't worked up until now, it's not going to work tomorrow either. <sighs> Whatever you're telling yourself up until this point if it hasn't made you into those people that you so deeply want to be, then it's not going to. So don't say, I, I can't change. Say, I'm going to change because I want to explore that unknown territory. I want to find out what my capacity is, what my potential is. I want to know what happens if I miss a day of work. <gasps> you know? How many of you take a day off of work just to take a day off of work? Good for you and good for you. How many of you are afraid to take a day off of work? Yes. Take a day off of work. <laughs> Learn what that is. to, to, to and, and I don't mean like all the time. I mean just once. <laughs> you know? Just once. Take a day off of work and take that day and be free with it. No pre-planning anything. No, no, like, from 7 a.m. until 5 p.m., this is what I'm going to fill that day with. No. Wake up that morning with no plan. And don't make it a Saturday or a Sunday either. It's got to be a work day. <laughs> no plan. Wake up in the morning and, and, and do a small meditation how you feel. And then go. Just go. Just go discover something. Well, where am I going to go? Who knows? There's a lot of roads out there to be traveled. Mm -hmm. So just follow one and don't make it a familiar one. Make it one that you haven't driven down before. Find some place you've never gone to before. Don't look online. Matter of fact, stay offline that day. No emails, no text messages, none of that. Go and get lost in the world just for a day. Go be adventurous. Give yourself that gift. Because before you know it, you won't be able to. Because you'll have taught yourself so deeply into making only one choice. Monday through Friday, work except for vacation, which will be absolutely planned out. Weekends will be structured highly to get the things done that I couldn't get done during the week. I will breathe only this much and this deep. 
take a day off of work and go explore. And for those of you who have taken a day off of work, if it was a highly structured day for a doctor's appointment or some other reason like that, then you too take a day off of work and go be an adventurer. Did you have your hand raised before? I don't have time. You have all the time in the world. You do. It's just that you're choosing to use it in a certain way. You know? The reality is, those Netflix shows that that so many binge on, you can binge a little less and live a little more. Right? Absolutely. People say to me, how do I start a meditation practice in the morning? You know, I mean, I already wake up so early. They're not going to like my answer. (laughs) So many of you are laughing because I probably, did I say to any of you? How many of you have I said that to? Yeah. Wake up earlier. I can't wake up earlier. Well, what time do you go to bed? Well, I don't know. Midnight, one o'clock. You know, it's like, go to bed earlier. I can't go to bed earlier. Why can't you go to bed earlier? There's a plethora of reasons, excuses. Why not, you know? Your life will shrink or expand according to the way you see it. So if you say, I can't wake up earlier in the morning to meditate more, then that's what you're talking yourself into believing. But if you say, I'm willing to look at my day and make different choices with how I utilize my time so that I can go to bed an hour earlier, so that I can wake up an hour earlier, then that's what you'll talk yourself into. You'll talk yourself into making better choices eventually. It won't happen right away necessarily. But the more that you tell yourself that you can do this, the more you will. Better choices is also, it also has to do with other more practical kind of things like eating. Yeah. Like what are the eating habits? So when I feel stressed out, when, when you know, the day-to-day traumas are building, 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 and I'm like, I can't take any more, where is the pizza? You know, where is the beer? Where is the wine? I just have one glass of wine a day because the doctors say it's great for you, right? You all know that's bullshit. <laughs> totally. It really is. One glass of wine a day is not okay for you if that glass of wine is an escape mechanism. It's a poor choice. If you're coming home from work and you're like, I need to relax, give me the mind-altering substance. (laughs) Yeah, now you won't ever get that visual out of your head and you'll be like, oh man. Take a glass of clean water, have a couple of sips, and go sit on your meditation cushion. Yeah. Make a better choice. And then if you're out having dinner and you are a wine drinker and you decide while you're in a state of contentment to have a glass of wine with your loved one, then have it. Because that's not a misuse. But if you have a seventh glass of wine, (laughs) and the seventh glass of wine, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth glasses of wine have taken you from that place of contentment, enjoying a meal with your partner or your friend, down into the depths of feeling poorly about yourself, complaining about work, wishing life could be better, then that becomes a misuse. Make a better choice. Make sense? Make a better choice. Conversations make a better choice. You don't have to be involved in every Facebook conversation. (laughs) You don't. Your opinion is not necessary. And it's not even listened to. If anything, your opinion on Facebook is just a trigger for other people's anger. So extract yourself from, from that to some degree. In your interpersonal conversations with the people who you see and you come face to face with often, remember always that for as stressed out and traumatized as you are, so are they. So don't have too many expectations that they're going to be a certain way. 
Don't think that they're going to have the capacity to hold space for you, for your complaining, for your story, for your needs. Don't have expectations of them because they may not have the capacity. And you will be left feeling disappointed, let down, and angry. Instead, approach every conversation with compassion, with a conscious ear that's listening for the condition of the other individual. And if you're going to start talking about some heavy stuff, ask permission first. It really is okay to ask ahead of time. You don't have to just kind of vomit all over them. You can say, you know, I've got some pretty heavy stuff going on in my life, but I don't really know what's going on in yours right now. So I'd like to ask, do you have the space right now that I could share a little bit of this with you? You don't have to give me any opinions or fix anything. I just kind of need a neutral ear. And give them the opportunity to say yay or nay. And if they say, you know, I really don't have the capacity right now, then guess what? The better choice might be for you to say to them, but you know what? I do have a little bit of space. Even though there's other things happening, I can hold some space for you. Why don't you share with me for a moment? What's going on? I won't give you an opinion, and I will not try to fix anything. Be of service. It is the greatest choice you can make. It takes us out of the realm of our own suffering and into the heart of compassion for the suffering of all others. And then if they say, you know, thanks so much for that offer, but I I really don't want to share, fine. The offer is there if you change your mind. And then go about your day. Just that kind of an exchange alone, do you see how sweet that can be? Mutual respect for each other. Mutual compassion for each other. Appreciation for each other. Rather than vomiting all over each other. I know. I like to use these scenarios that are very clear. (laughs) Very, very clear. The third is collaborating with supportive people. And this is also extremely important. So as you're dealing with day-to-day traumas or with the, the, the greater traumas, then, which the day-to-day traumas do become a great trauma, so we could just leave that there. Um, having a supportive community around you is really important. And just for your information, a supportive community is not a community of yes people. It's not a community of people who agree with you. It's not a community of people who allow you to displace the blame. Those are not supportive people. They're not. They're not helping you. A group of supportive people are individuals who have the capacity to hold the space for your suffering while also tending to their own without burdening you. And by burdening, I mean displacing their suffering onto you. A group of supportive people are the ones who reassure you of your strength, your courage, your bravery, your creativity. A group of reassuring individuals are also the ones who are pretty straightforward with you in in hopefully a kind way. And they tell you, do you know how full of this you are right now? You can move away from this if you choose to. You just have to cultivate the strength within yourself to do so. Those are supportive people. And if we're talking about the deeper, intense traumas, like abuse, then supportive people include clinicians, therapists, coaches, people who have been trained to support under very particular circumstances. Those are the supportive people. And in building your community of supportive people, you minimize the access of the non-supportive ones. You minimize their access to you. And your access to them. In doing that, in following these these first three steps, we learn how much of our own suffering we are actually responsible for. Because if I allow you to treat me badly, if I don't set my boundaries, if I don't seek supportive individuals as a community if I don't make better choices myself to whatever degree I can, then in some part, 
I'm allowing you to treat me the way you treat me. Now, take that with a grain of salt because, of course, there are always circumstances. A woman has a difficult time moving away from an abusive partner, and maybe a man has a difficult time moving away from an abusive partner. We have a difficult time. Sometimes it seems impossible, and sometimes we've been so, so deeply traumatized that we can't see the light of day. It's just not possible. There is no hope in that space of being consistently hurt and harmed. But in any moment, there's a wonderful story, actually. came across my, believe it or not, Facebook feed. (laughs) And it was about, uh, what is her name again? The actress who was married to Tom Cruise. No, the second one. Oh, um, Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes. And this little story, it was just a little blurb thing that came across. And you know that he's like a Scientology thing and they're looked at as a cult and all of this stuff. And she was apparently, you know, trapped in this relationship with him. And once you're involved and invested in that organization, you know, there's nothing has ever been proven about it. You know, this is, it's, it's a very interesting situation and subject. But apparently from a lot of, of, of um, reflections of people who have been involved in that once you're in there, you really can't leave. And apparently, I don't, maybe it's in her memoir or something, she was talking about how she finally became able to leave because she had a daughter with Tom Cruise and that also kind of embedded her in that community and made it even more difficult for her to leave, if not perhaps impossible. And that it was a friend it was a friend. It was, it was Adam Sandler, apparently, according to this story, who, who actually kind of helped her make the corridor to leave. She found that supportive person, and that person helped her out, and she was able to then see the light of day and the potential of her own freedom. Now, I don't know if the facts of that to- story, how true they are, how false they are, I have no idea, but I do know that her story is symbolic of a lot of our stories about the times where we have been stuck in a very dark place and we have accepted that as our only reality. All you need to do to some, some degree is open your eyes and look for a compassionate, supportive person and they might be able to shed a little bit of light for you. You know, maybe Yeah, look for the helpers. I love that. Yes, look for the helpers completely. So collaborate with supportive people. And then the other collaboration with supportive people is you know what it's like to be highly stressed and traumatized by that stress and to not, to some degree, have things in a place where you can be the adventurous self, the happy self, the joyful self, the the strong self, the brave self, the free self. And whatever amount of work that you yourself are doing in this life, you know what it takes to do that work, to make the decision to do the work. So now you can be of service to others and share your story. You don't have to do it in a way that's like pushy and because, you know, nobody likes that, right? Like, well, here, this is what I would do if I were you. No, 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 no. Just sharing your story. Write it out. Life was like this. And I felt lost and confused and hopeless. And like, how do I even come out from that? And this is, this is what happened. And this is what I did. And this is the work I undertook. And this is the outcome I've had so far. Because the work continues. And you just share it. Send it to a magazine. Post it on your website if you have one. Put it up on your Facebook page. No comments allowed. No comments allowed. Because you don't want it to be a vulnerability in that regard, but a sharing. So you know, many of you know that not long after my husband passed, I actually posted a very, very long Facebook post. And I'm really grateful for those of you who took the time to read it, (laughs) because it was pretty long. And in there, I kind of documented my grief. And I've never held back about that because, because 
My grief is a teaching. Your grief is also a teaching. It's a teaching to me and it's a teaching to anybody who witnesses it. Your, teaching is a te- your grief is a teaching to you and a teaching to anybody who witnesses it. <clears throat> I had one person who messaged me and said something to the effect of, you wear, you're wearing that on your sleeve. Aren't you worried about the feedback you're going to get from people? And no, I'm not, not at all, actually. Not in any way, shape, or form. If it supports one person, it's purposeful. So compared to that one message, there were potentially 150 messages, maybe a lot more, of people who were like, thank you so much because I haven't been able to find the words for what I've been going through. I lost my spouse too. I lost my child. I lost this person in my life. And, and this is helping me to frame that, to put it into a picture that, that I can work with. So, so take your experience honestly and sincerely and allow it to be a service to those who are in deep levels of suffering. Don't push it on people. They'll find you. Just make it accessible. And above all, be the example. Let people see the way that you're living your life, the way that you've changed, the way that you've moved from depression to a simple kind of joy, from denial to acceptance, from self-deprecation to self-love. Let people see that. Don't be afraid. Defining and allowing trustworthiness is the fourth necessity. Because when we're in that space of traumatization at any level, there is a tendency to not trust because we don't want any more. And so the friendliest person can come up to you and be like, hey, How are you doing today? And you're like, back off, buddy. Nope. You want something from me and I have nothing to give. And we become defensive. And in our defensiveness, we become violent. And in our violence, we turn our back on our inner peace. And in that, we need to really know that in doing that, we are contributing to a more violent world So we need to find a way to build trustworthiness between ourselves and other individuals. And the greatest way to do that is through the healthy boundaries, is to be honest also. Honesty is so important. You know what? I really don't have the bandwidth for this right now because I'm just feeling really overwhelmed by my own life and I I just don't know that I would be the clearest reflection right now for what it is that you need to share or you know I in this moment do not have the skill to deal with what you're putting in front of me so I'm going to remove myself because if I don't I might lose my temper I might lash back out at you and I don't want to do that so we can talk later when I'm in a different mindset and maybe you will be too We have to be able to be honest and to not allow our emotions to drag us around by the ear. Did you all have that aunt too? Eh, You know, or the grandmother. If it wasn't the ear, it was the hair. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And they didn't do it angrily. They did it lovingly, you know, but still, or the cheek, you know. Mm. So defining and allowing trustworthiness. What What is trustworthy to you? You need to know that. You need to define that for yourself. What is trustworthy? Because trustworthy is not just that people agree with you. Just like friendship is not just that people agree with you or build you up to make you feel really good about yourself. Yeah. Trustworthiness is the person that you know you can go to who's not going to give you a line of BS. They're the person who you know you can go to and they're going to gently but firmly put it on the line for you. They're also the person who will listen without giving you an opinion without giving you the judgmental look, you know? They're the person who's just going to listen. Now, you might, you might perceive that it's a judgmental look. That doesn't mean they're giving it to you. Yeah. So we also have to be aware of that, of what our own limitations are. Well, 
they looked at me a certain way or said something a certain way. No. It's more likely that you simply took it that way. Yeah. That you just took it that way. Right? And then finally, the fifth, I'm just going to do a little time check. The fifth is uh, personal empowerment. You need to have a willingness to empower yourself. And empowerment sometimes means saying no. Period. And empowerment sometimes means saying yes. Period. And then if saying no or saying yes brings up fear, anxiety, animosity, angst within you, then dealing with that. Empowerment, self-empowerment is growing into yourself in a way that you have greater clarity about who you want to be, who you are, and the path to get there. Who you really are. So not the version of yourself that is like greatly lacking in all those other things, but, the, but who you really are. Every thought in your mind is like a wave in the ocean. All those damaging thoughts, all those demeaning thoughts, all those angry thoughts, all those sad thoughts, all those limiting thoughts, they're all like waves in the ocean. But as I mentioned earlier this weekend to the retreat attendees, have you ever seen a wave that didn't resolve back into the ocean? Never. And what is the ocean? Peace. Peace. All of those thoughts in your mind will resolve themselves back into the ocean of peace that is the internal space of yourself. You just have to let them. So don't hold on to them so tightly. Don't repeat them over and over to yourself. There's a teaching. It says, read it once or listen to it once. Hear it and then let it go. Because the more that you go over it and over it and over it and over it, the more questions that you'll come up with about it. The more you'll hear something that wasn't there. So you have a thought come into the mind. There I go again. I'm not worthy. Just leave it alone. It'll go away on its own. Don't grab it. Don't hold it hostage. Don't look at it as being your true identity because it's not. Your true identity is that of the ocean. It's peace. That's just a disturbance in in the ocean. That's all, you know. And all disturbances resolve themselves eventually. So I just want to share two two, uh, quotes with you. One by uh, Gabor Mott, which I think that's the way you say his name. Not the world, not what's outside of us, but what we hold inside traps us. We may not be responsible for the world that created our mind, but we can take responsibility for the mind with which we create our world. Such a great, give me goosebumps. And then the second quote that I just want to share with you today is by Maya Angelou. Do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, (laughs) do better. Exactly. Any questions or reflections? Are we good? Yes. Just think, I wonder how many people are calling off at work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Raise of hands. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, I was very like, captivated when you said that the ocean is peace. Mm-hmm. Why, are you, why do you say that? Like, I know that. Like, you know, in my spirit, I know that because that's where I find peace. So, why do you say it that way? You know, is there any, any behind that? Yeah. So the, the symbology of the ocean as peace is, is used a lot in this tradition, uh, Advaita Vedanta. The ocean is very similar to the universe itself. You have this body of some kind of consciousness. And there's a lot going on in it. It has not much going on, but there's a lot going on in it. In the universe, there's suns, planets, moons, stars. There's beings, lots of things going on in it. But the universe itself is just there. 
The ocean has fish and coral, less than it used to, but still does. Whales and dolphins and, you know, currents and things like that. But the ocean itself is just there. It's a space of potential. And the potential is always just there waiting. It doesn't disturb anything. It's just there as a potentiality. Inside of ourselves, we're what what is called the microcosm of the macrocosm. So the inside of the self, not the inside of the physical body. This is just a body. This is just what's often lovingly called a meat bag, right? Yeah, this is just a body. But the soul, the spirit within, is a microcosm of the ocean and of the universe. It's a reflection of that on a much smaller scale. There may be a lot going on with this body. There may be a lot of things, and this body is within the soul, and it's within the spirit. You know, it's kind of moving around in there like the fish swims through the ocean or like the planet moves through the universe. But in the soul itself, there is only potentiality. And that potentiality is in and of itself the peaceful stillness that exists there. They say, and I don't know, this might sound a little bit morbid, or, and I hope it doesn't trigger for anybody, but they say that if, if someone were to kill themselves, if they were to take their own life, the most peaceful way to do it is to go out into the ocean. As they say, they say the most peaceful way to do it is to drown. Because the ocean is just so encompassing and peaceful. Now, I don't know who they asked that question of (laughs) or how they came to that conclusion. I have no idea. I probably used to know, but I don't remember. But... And also, but but even look at it that way, because you said yourself, when you go to swim in the ocean, when you go to the ocean, it's it's just so peaceful. It's a reminder of what you are potential, what you you are within your own self. So when you go into the ocean, it's it's almost like a union. It's like peace meets peace, and all that's there is peace. There's, no, there's not a care in the world when you're there. I don't, maybe for some people, but for me personally, there's not a care in the world. It's like everything just kind of melts away. And I'm reminded of, of my own potential. So we use the ocean a lot symbolically. We use the universe a lot symbolically as being representations of that which may have disturbances on the surface of it. But all those disturbances reconcile back into it. And the reconciliation is peace. Yeah. I know I went on for a moment, but I love that conversation, if you haven't been able to tell. Any other questions or reflections right now? Are we good? How many of you are going to change something? Change is possible. Change is possible. Woo! Woo! Jema! Change is possible. So how many of you really are going to go home and consider changing one little thing to reduce the the day-to-day traumas. Good. I'm glad to see it. Absolutely. It's definitely worthwhile. And if for no other reason, if for no other reason it is worthwhile, just so you know what you're missing out on. Right? Mm -hmm. We say, no, I got to go to the club to know what I'm missing out on. I got to go to the movie to know what I'm missing out on. I got to go to the restaurant to know what I'm missing out on. I got to go date that person to know what I'm missing out on. No, you've got to go here to know what you're missing out on. Just one other thing, I think, um, just the information and the knowledge and the educating yourself, like, I think that's the most important piece. Oh, yeah. Before you can do any of it. Of course. So. And that has to be accessible to a person. Right. And sadly, it's not accessible to everybody. But it, it could be. Right. Maybe that's, your, maybe that's your path in life is to support <laughs> making it accessible. Yeah. Absolutely. So now those of you who were here on retreat this weekend, please stay um, after we close the session. I have one more little thing to give you. And so let's everybody sit tall and close the eyes. Draw the hands together in front of the heart. And as we chant one ohm followed by the all beings mantra, 
Let us send out that intention. May all beings everywhere be peaceful and free from suffering. May they have access to that wisdom. May they truly come to know the heart of their own self as goodness. Lifting our voices. Loka samasta sukino bhavantu Loka samasta sukino bhavantu Loka samasta sukino bhavantu Om shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om